Our next speaker is the Dean of Research with SANS. He's a senior instructor with SANS. He also directs the Internet Storm Center. Um, he founded DShield, which is now part of Internet Storm Center, as I understand. Uh, he has a podcast. He has a blog. He has numerous publications. He's been honored by SC Magazine, by Network World Magazine. Uh, he's an a, uh, innovative, ed cutting-edge researcher. He's a thought leader. I'm very, very pleased to welcome Johannes Ulrich. Thank you very much for the great introduction. So I can uh, skip right over uh, the introductory slide here, introducing myself. Uh, just want to add to it, I'm actually from Jacksonville, a little bit uh, up the road here. Sometimes referred to not as Florida, but uh, Southern Georgia, uh, if you're familiar with the area. Uh, but uh, anyway, so uh, let me get uh, started right away here. Uh, anybody here using NoSQL databases right now in, in your environment? Okay, I, so, so half of you. who is using NoSQL and SQL databases? Okay, I think I see about the same number of hands going up here. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the Internet Storm Center. I just uh, want to uh, introduce this very little bit because some of the work I'm presenting here is based on it. And uh, it's not really just my work. Uh, that would really be dishonest to say that. A uh, good contribution here came by from Boyan. Boyan is one of our handlers. He lives in uh, Croatia. He's doing a lot of pen testing. And towards the end, I'll talk a little bit about sort of complex data types, how they can be abused when it comes to NoSQL databases. And uh, this work is really sort of uh, mostly his work I'm uh, presenting here. Now, when we talk about NoSQL, what does it mean? Yeah? I think uh, the one thing everybody can agree on that NoSQL means just that, you know, everything but SQL databases. Um, I'll, I'll talk really about two aspects of uh, NoSQL security, and uh, some of it sort of comes with the simplicity of uh, these databases. The reason people like NoSQL databases is they're simpler, they're faster, they're more agile than a lot of these more traditional uh, SQL databases, and uh, well, that, that sometimes comes at a cost, uh, uh, this uh, speed. Uh. So no more joins. Well, uh, that's not really a security issue. That may be a security advantage if uh, you can write simpler queries, and often it turns out to be a security advantage that the, that the that the queries are simpler. But when we talk about simpler storage engines, well, a simple means also less control in many ways. And of course, that's sort of uh, where security hits us. Now, it covers a very wide range, like I said, when we talk about NoSQL. I'll go over some of the basic NoSQL databases uh, that sort of I worked with uh, over the years and, and that I have investigated for this. Uh, but uh, keep in mind that uh, really a lot of this is true for database I may not explicitly uh, point out here uh, in this uh, talk. Like, we, have a, we have a worldwide range here. For example, uh, one that I sort of removed for this talk because I don't really see it as a database, Hadoop. Anybody using Hadoop? Yeah. Uh, nobody using Hadoop. Yeah. Is it a database or not? Yeah. Uh, I call it a file system, a distributed file system. Yeah? Uh, some people call it uh, a database. Yeah? Uh, but, uh, and, and that's really sort of the problem. That's really sort of a ranging scale of uh, systems that we have. Now, what I looked at is how well do these uh, databases support of your basic security controls, authentication, access control, how do we encrypt data in transit? Is there any chance to encrypt it sort of in the database at rest? So that's another a big part here. And, you know, in the end, if stuff happens, you want to know what happened. So what kind of logs do we get out of these databases? And they're certainly attacked quite a bit. Uh, here is a statistics from Shodan. All familiar with Shodan that sort of scans your networks and finds all the vulnerable systems. They found 100,000 exposed memcached databases out there uh, that are ready for the taking. And they are being taken. This was a Big compromise, not sure if anybody remembers that. Uh, these little toys that you buy for your kids because you don't like to talk to them, so uh, you buy them like a little toy to talk to your kids. And um, well, uh, here database was compromised that actually stored all the voice snippets that these uh, teddy bears in this case recorded, Mongo, uh, DB here. And uh, just um, last, uh, no, this was uh, uh, ransomware. We all know ransomware from desktops. Well, it goes after database as well, and of course, in this case, they don't encrypt your data. They just delete it and then claim they encrypt it and sell you that encryption key. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So a little bit of variation on that uh, ransomware theme. And yeah, this was the one uh, that just happened last week. Exposed Elasticsearch servers, and they were actually mostly in Amazon's cloud, were used for botnet command control. So these databases are attacked all the time. And just to uh, bring that message home a little bit, when I set up my computer, I set up a little honeypot on sort of three very common ports. First one, Elasticsearch. Well, we already got some requests here, you know, some HTTP requests. Uh, the second one, uh, 11.22, that's uh, memcached. Uh, so already got two stats requests here. And then the last one, MongoDB, it looks like we got sort of two requests uh, coming in here. And this was like within the 15 minutes that I uh, set up a laptop here on, on sort of our HoneyNet uh, infrastructure. So uh, they're being hit. Now, let's start with Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is a cool database uh, if you try to write a web application because it provides that really simple REST JSON interface. Um, so JavaScript is really built to the right little uh, search clients or, or clients uh, for Elasticsearch. Uh, it also used to add a very popular and very powerful scripting language, Groovy. Uh, Groovy had one small problem. It was so powerful, you couldn't really constrain it very well. They tried to put in a sandbox, didn't work, yeah, because you could break out of the sandbox if you used the right Groovy command. And in this case, for example, you could execute arbitrary shell commands. Uh, Groovy pretty much has been removed, so that ability just ripped it out. They were talking about putting something as a replacement, like they have Lucene, the other scripting language, not quite as powerful. Yeah. And you know, as a developer, you always want power, yeah, security. That's someone else's problem. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, in, in older versions, when it's still enabled, you can disable the feature. Yeah, but like I said, in current versions, it, it has really just uh, been removed. Yeah. Now, Elasticsearch actually has a document that tells you what to do sort of as best practices. Yeah. Um, only have it listen on loopback. Yeah. Great idea until you try to put it in the cloud and try to remote connect to it. Yeah? And then all of that really doesn't work all that well anymore. Yeah? So uh, there was uh, one problem. You can enable SSL. And you have one advantage with Elasticsearch because it is all HTTP. You can just put an HTTP proxy in front of it yeah? and have it do filtering, authentication, all of that good stuff. So that's sort of one way to retrofit security uh, a little bit. Yeah. Yes, it's certainly being scanned. You just saw my honeypot results. This is data that we collect sort of with our um, honeypots and such. Uh, this sort of per day, we have about, this is the number of sources, source IPs, that are scanning f each day for Elasticsearch. It's around a 1,000 sort of that, that we detect uh, each day. And this is last month's data. So. Elasticsearch, out of the box, security, not so much. A lot of the security you have to enable, you have to add a later with a proxy. And particularly if you want something a little bit more fine-grained, fine-grained access control, um, you know, you're probably uh, left uh, to doing that uh, with a proxy. And then, of course, it can get a little bit tricky. Your proxy isn't really going to parse the query. So uh, how do you identify users? How do you identify privileges there? Uh, uh, not as you're used to with SQL, where I can define for each row who has exactly access to. Now, MongoDB was the other one that I had up here, and the other database that uh, you know, we had already a couple of uh, hits for. I'll come back to MongoDB later, but in some ways I find it very similar to Elasticsearch. It's also a JSON object I'm storing in the database, uh, very sort of HTTP-based. Uh, the, the database, the way it works. It actually does have role-based access control, so that's a big plus. And you usually do not find this in, um, in these NoSQL databases. You have to enable it, but then again, your know, role-based access control, you usually have to enable it. They can't enable that for you uh, necessarily. Also, make sure, and it's another sort of thing that's really support, important for all of these databases, run the latest version. It's not just security bugs, it's security features that were added uh, over the years uh, to it. And uh, while you're running the latest version, I know I'm a developer, and we all know developers here. Hmm? 
they know everything, so they never read the manual. So uh, read the manual and how to configure all of this, yeah? including some of the security uh, guidance that uh, these databases offer uh, to, to users. Yeah? Uh, now, there's even some encryption that is sort of built in a database. So uh, that's actually not bad. Yeah? Uh, that's you know, even a lot of SQL databases struggle with sort of doing effective and, and proper encryption at rest. Yeah? Uh, yes, they have a local key file, but it doesn't actually integrated key management and all the good stuff that you really expect from sort of solid uh, encryption at rest. Yeah? Uh, but remember, you, know, you need to run the latest version. Same for logs. Now, MongoDB is almost no longer a uh, NoSQL database. It has way too many features for that when it comes to security. But uh, yes, you know, they, they now even added logs. Just like all of these logs, logs are typically not encrypted, so you know, be careful what you log uh, when you're worried about that. Uh, but at least you have that, uh, that uh, log to, to see what really happened. Yeah? And just like Elasticsearch, yeah? MongoDB, probably the same thousand hosts that are scanning for that. Yeah? They're trying to find your, your servers here. So here's a quick uh, summary. Yeah? Well, as far as NoSQL databases go, MongoDB is probably the one that sort of has the most security features. You have to enable them all, but well, that's, that's part of life. Yeah? And uh, that's not really that uh, special. Yeah? yeah, Hadoop, like I said, don't really want to talk much about this because it really sort of spreads, uh, it goes beyond the scope here a little bit uh, when it comes to it. But um, the problem from a security point of view is here again uh, that, you know, this very simple HTTP REST access. Now, we all like REST web services. They're simple, they're easy, they're fast. But cross-site request forging. Uh, one HTTP request to a Hadoop uh, database cluster uh, can really be uh, very uh, catastrophic. So uh, be careful how you filter. Be careful when you do authentication uh, to it. And Hadoop, sort of, as really more of a file system, has more of uh, those controls built in. So uh, not that bad, really. Well, uh, OK, uh, so which ones are not that great? Well, uh, got uh, one database here, uh, Memcached. Now, Memcached really focuses on speed. It's all in memory. That's sort of the idea. Eh? Uh, so the entire database lives in memory, very simple key value lookups. Absolutely no access control there. And then you, know, you have to figure out what data do you store in that database. Session IDs and things like this, okay, you know, um, only the web server needs to have access to. I don't really need a lot of sort of fine-grained access control for something like this. Conven conventional data, social security numbers, credit card numbers, maybe not so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, for it. And, and then again, uh, based on it being in memory, it's really more sort of a non-persistent database anyway. So uh, I think that removes the risk somewhat here. Where this becomes really interesting is, yes, you, know, you should restrict access uh, to localhost, but one of the great features of Memcached is that you sort of can spread it out, you can build clusters that requires network connectivity. So um, with that, you know, the network access is required in some ways. If you do move it out into the cloud, um, then of course you no longer may have control over that network as you're used to. There's a very close cousin uh, to Memcache, the Redis. Um, Redis actually in their security notes describes that this database is designed to be run in trusted environment between trusted clients and trust servers. Well, anybody here has a network you trust? Mm -hmm. um, so you haven't really looked close enough probably why to trust or not to trust it. Uh, uh, this really much is valid for here. So really, um, the only security we have here in Memcache data is simple sort of password-based authentication, but no roles. It's just one user uh, to authenticate for it, and uh, that's it. And one that, once there is access uh, to the database, eh, then of course it is almost sort of a little bit, you know, a game over uh, for you. But anyway, yeah, let's just see how many more people did we have got in here. I think we got two more stats requests here. Eh? Uh, sadly, they never sent sort of a elastic search request here, and I don't reply with anything. Eh? But um, you do see we have now one, two, three, four requests to our 
sort of elastic search listener. Uh, so um, uh, these things are continuously attacked. Now, that's uh, really sort of uh, one of the big problems here. So how do we secure it? I'm not big into just breaking stuff. I also want to know, you know how, how to fix it. And um, a couple things, I already mentioned that. You know, use the latest version. Like I said, not just because there's some security vulnerabilities that happened over the years that are fixed in the latest version. Uh, you want to have the latest major version, not just sort of the, the security fix, because it gives you more control. It typically gives you more features related to security. There's something over the last two years, all of these databases have added quite a bit more features. So uh, there's certainly a substantial uh, change that happened. And when you're writing your code, you know, just don't expect that a database does a lot of what you're used to when you're sort of used to writing SQL code. And when you're writing uh, stored procedures, a lot, a couple of you. Like, uh, there's very nice things that you can do in traditional SQL with stored procedures for access control. You know? And because in your stored procedure, check what user is being used, and then you know, do, do all of the stored procedures, uh, centralize it that way, real create things that you can do, not in NoSQL. In NoSQL, you typically don't even have different users as far as database is concerned. So this really puts a more weight on the code. Now, when we talk about NoSQL applications, a lot of the times we're talking about these newer you know, interactive applications where more of that code is actually residing on our client, not necessarily even on the server. So like you know, the client connecting to the database without even going through any server-side code. JavaScript creating those REST queries that are then being directly sent to Elasticsearch or, or MongoDB. Uh, so now you're even more tempted to do client-side authentication, which always works great until the first incident. But um, so yeah, you don't have that, that access control available. Never ever expose one of these NoSQL databases to the network, to the public network. And I put in parentheses, oh, not a great idea for traditional SQL queries either. And a lot of the attacks that I showed earlier when it comes to NoSQL databases, they happen against you know, standard SQL databases as well. Like exposed MySQL servers getting encrypted. Happens all the time, or data being leaked and such. Uh, uh, that certainly happens. So uh, do not expose them on the public network. The big threat here is that your incentive to actually doing that increased. Yeah, because now you want the client to connect directly to that database. You never really do that with a SQL database. You have to try really hard to do that. Yeah? Uh, but um, here it's now sort of standard operating procedure to have the client, JavaScript on the client, send queries directly back to the database, which of course requires it being exposed. Yeah, and uh, then the authentication mechanisms, you know, figure out what works there. It's just simple password. Can you do SSL certificates or whatever? Uh, so again, see, see what works. So typically not the same way we have it. Now there's one way. Where SQL sort of sounds, no SQL sounds a bit different. What about SQL injection? Now, we all know we write prepared statements, SQL injection isn't really a problem anymore, yeah? other than for applications we wrote last year. Uh, but um, what about uh, with no SQL injection? Well, let's think about it. The problem with SQL injection is that we mix user data and code. You have the select statements that from and the queries, you know, and then you insert some user data in here that can rewrite the query. Can we do the same thing with NoSQL? And the answer is uh, maybe sometimes yes, it works. It depends. What we have with NoSQL that you don't really have so much with Normal SQL is these complex data types like JSON. Anybody was here in this room before lunch they had a real great talk about sort of deserializing JSON and such. And what did they tell you? Yeah. Don't do it with untrusted data. Yeah, so um, 
check your type and make, make sure it's, it's all uh, done correctly. Well, yeah, that's hard, or it's much easier not to do it. So anyway, so NoSQL, it's, yeah, we always describe them as key value pairs. Yeah, that's not how it's described. But those values are usually fairly complex data types, like, you know, like JSON is sort of the, the number one here uh, to, to really uh, worry about. And parsing JSON and deserializing it or serializing it uh, can cause issues. We sort of try to pull these values out of uh, JSON. Yeah? And um, why is this hard? Well, again, we have a very complex data type. Yeah? I know I'm committing a little bit of blasphemy here, but you know, JSON is really no different than XML. Yeah? Uh, so um, it's, it's these complex nested data types, and I don't think anybody really has figured out how to properly parse you know, those type of data types. Yeah? Uh, whenever they, they happen, you know, we, uh, we have a hard time figuring out you know, how are they delimited. Yeah? Yes, yeah, here I put nice double quotes around it, but we may have single quotes. Uh, how is now data being pulled from the user and inserted into a JSON object like that? Uh, that's uh, you know, where, where problems, very simple problems, uh, really happen. And we're not necessarily talking here about uh, super complex stuff. Yeah? So, you know, for example, here, if I'm inserting JSON objects like this, yeah? if I'm inserting stuff like this blindly into my you know, MongoDB Elasticsearch, it doesn't really care. Yeah? It's not like in SQL where I have to have the right number of columns. Yeah? Um, I can just you know, throw data at it and it'll slurp it up. Yeah? Uh, now, um, at the minimum, you know, I'll just fill up the database with garbage, yeah? which um, at first, okay, may not really do much damage, but when your query language is also sort of based on JSON, then again, we're back to mixing up code and data. So in this case, the JSON encoding, we're, we're mixing it uh, into code. And here's sort of a, a little example, and this is sort of uh, the real world application uh, is one that Boyan ran into in a pen test here. Uh, this is sort of your standard MongoDB query. Now, uh, this was a mean, so mean uh, that Acronym refers to MongoDB, you know, ExpressJS, AngularJS, Node.js. It's one of these applications to get like a little hello world. You have to download 20 megabytes of code and then it does something. Uh, but uh, anyway, this is sort of what the query looked like. So we're going to get all products for which we have a quantity of greater than 25. And you already noticed you know, how this is sort of JSON, our query parameters now become JSON, so uh, that's really you know, where, where bad stuff happens. Yeah? So in this particular case, yeah? so a little code here, a little code snippet. Yeah? So there was this ID was being parsed, uh, was being passed as a parameter. Yeah? Developer expected a number. Yeah? So here we just create that query yeah? out of that uh, particular ID. Yeah? So just your standard JSON parse and this friendly parameter is what's a search parameter here. We just add that user supplied parameter. And then we use this JSON snippet in our standard sort of MongoDB query here. The find one, return the first match. Here's our query and then you know, launch this function whenever um, it, it works. So that's, uh, that's very simple, very standard uh, sort of MongoDB sort of JavaScript code. How do you exploit it? Well, what we are passing to the database now is or no longer just a number. Instead, we're passing sort of a query snippet. Doesn't this look just like SQL injection? Yeah, the characters look a little bit different. But really the logic behind it is it's just the same as SQL injection. And what we end up with now in our query, if we go just back here, so that parameter here is now that not equal null. So this becomes now the search parameter here, because now friendly and then square brackets not equal null. Null. So okay. Hey, return me everything where friendly is not null. That's really sort of what we are ending up with here. Yeah, and this worked in this case. 
So we're really back into SQL injection territory here you know, with, with some of these applications. The problem with this is a little bit from a security testing point of view. Your standard vulnerability scan that looks for SQL injection will not necessarily find this. Uh, if you're lucky, you get an error message. So like, you know, if you do the quotes and such, uh, so at least to tell you that there may be a problem. Uh, but it's probably not going to recognize the response if there is a response, like if there isn't an, an error message coming back. And that's sort of you know, where, uh, where some of your security then uh, fails. Mm -hmm. Now this was specifically with um, MongoDB. Mm -hmm. Elasticsearch, I could imagine very similar scenarios uh, that looks uh, really just sort of um, very much alike. The query language is a little bit different. There is Lucene language that uh, Elasticsearch likes. But again, you know, I can pass JSON objects and they're being parsed uh, by, by the database. In addition, of course, you know, these REST APIs. Well, we all know cross-site scripting and cross-site request forging is sort of that very deadly combination. Let's just assume for a moment go to your happy place. No, we don't have cross-site scripting in our website. Yeah. We still have to be worried about these cross-origin requests. Yeah. Modern browsers, they will send the request. They don't take the response, but they will send the request cross-origin. So if you didn't add your custom header to make that pre-flight, or if you don't sort of have some handshake there with some uh, validation cookie uh, uh, to make sure that uh, this wasn't authorized across origin requests, uh, uh, then you may have problems again. Um, so, you know, all of the good JavaScript functions that we need, you know, for these applications to work, you know, uh, they can now be used against you. you know? And it's really up to the browser to see what works and what doesn't work which of course means that once there's a bug in the browser that doesn't do the same origin policy correctly, you, your site may be vulnerable if, if you're allowing uh, these requests. And um, I'm not sure if anybody ever looked at browsers, how well they implement different cross-origin standards. I, I wrote a sort of a test page for that and I found it's mixed what you find, in particular what headers you can add and not add. Uh, uh, specification is one thing. What's actually being implemented in real life with browsers is another thing. Uh, could probably do a whole different talk about that part. Uh, um, yeah, and, and then of course, uh, sending these queries directly uh, to the browser. So really the database now, because it does accept HTTP, really acts a lot more than a web application. And that's why we sort of almost cut out the middleman here. That's why we have all of our code in JavaScript on the browser and then have it connect directly back to the database because the database really sort of acts like a web application, a web server, and that's, uh, that sort of entices us to write uh, these particular uh, applications. Of course, uh, in a good old traditional web application, our firewall, you know, could, uh, our web application firewall could restrict us to get post head. You know? No, MongoDB, you better allow delete, you know? uh, because you need that in order to send delete requests to the database you know? uh, as an HTTP request. Uh, so. Uh, uh, really, really tricky uh, how you also set up web application firewalls that connect when, when your client connects directly back uh, to these uh, web uh, servers. Now, there are a couple things uh, here. Um, so, for example, Elasticsearch. Uh, Elasticsearch, you can enable uh, these headers, but again, you have to do it. Uh, you have to set your origins correctly. By default, it actually sets it to asterisk, if I remember correctly. Uh, the problem here I see sort of in, in real life. Uh, you're a developer, you develop your application, you set up all these headers correctly, or a sysadmin does that for you, then you move it live, and then all of your host names change and stuff like this, and it no longer works. You know? uh, returning it to the asterisk, to the wildcard, is the simple fix to make it work. Uh, so that's, that's sort of one reason uh, why, why you have that. Yeah, yeah and, um, and here is sort of another uh, little example. Uh, um, when you did the simple post request, that's sort of how you would then write the query. Yeah? Uh, I have of the do something evil with the data, yeah? uh, where the attacker now can insert arbitrary data, deposit on a web page, and, and then have the request sent. Like I said, the request will be sent. You may not get the response back with cross-origin restrictions, but the request is typically still sent. Yeah? So if you're not careful there, uh, you do have uh, problems. Yeah? So, other methods, well, um, 
hard to avoid them. A good old web application firewalling was so much easier. And even though anybody ever had to maintain a web application firewall? Was it easy? Not really. It, it just got harder, kind of if you do it for that. So, um, yeah, and you know, the, the REST request back to something like Elasticsearch and MongoDB uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, can make it more uh, difficult for you. Uh, so quick conclusion here to give us enough uh, time for uh, some questions as well. Um, RTFM, yeah, read the fine manual. Uh, like I said, it's, um, it's important because this stuff keeps changing and they keep adding more controls. Like I said, make sure you set those course headers correctly uh, uh, to prevent some of these sort of simple one-click attacks and such uh, uh, to, make that, to make that work for you. Uh, default configurations are never sufficient from a security point of view, so you definitely want to improve on that. Uh, and like I said, it's not something NoSQL specific. Uh, network access, and this gets really tricky. Like, uh, if you do expose the database to the user, if you have one of those applications, at the very least, put a proxy in there. Yes, it will delay your application response a little bit. Yes, it adds latency. Uh, get a fast proxy, it's not that bad. Uh, to do a little bit more filtering there. Uh, authentication, again, it doesn't really help you if the client connects directly back. Uh, because then you have to give the credentials to the client, which, yeah, uh, they're keeping it secret. They'll, they'll promise. Yeah? Put in your EULA, then, it, then they won't, um, then they won't uh, leak them. Yeah? And uh, look at the logs. I am a big fan of logs. Yeah? Um, I look at logs all the time, but I know it can be boring. If looking at your logs is boring, then you're not looking hard enough. There's always something interesting in there. Uh, so uh, definitely do that, and um, you know, when you're doing a code review, that entire process of how are you dealing with this complex data, you know, um, which APIs are you using to parse it, you know, uh, how do you configure that, that's the hard part, focus on that. You know. um, there aren't really sort of any simple workarounds that I've seen for that. Um, design your application to only accept easy data, that would be nice. You know. My application only accept numbers. That usually doesn't work, but um, if, if you can, you know, also application design can help uh, quite a bit. So anyway, I think we still have sort of 10 minutes for questions or so. Yeah. So um, any questions? Yes, sir. Any, any equivalent for NoSQL parameterized query, you know, protections? Like, for instance, it seems like in the examples you showed, it all comes down to the same, the same issue, key and value, and whether yeah. those two ever are allowed to touch each other in the code, right? Yeah. So yeah. if the inputs, even if it was hierarchical, without knowing the structure of whatever data type it is, had some type of generic dictionary only allowed, that the dictionary can include other dictionaries as values, that's fine, but it only allowed that separation always of key and value for the values being mm. provided, that might help for a parameterized query. Yes, and I think you're sort of on a good track there. So the question here was, you know, is there something like parameterized queries? for NoSQL, because you know, that saves our bacon when it comes to, to SQL, you know, parameterized queries. Yeah? Uh, nobody got rid of SQL injection until we sort of did the parameterized queries. Yeah? For NoSQL, I haven't really seen anything like that. Yeah? The problem I find is that you're passing these JSON objects back there, you know, like in MongoDB, and, now, and then it again depends on the database, but, uh, and the query itself is also a JSON object. And uh, I think that's sort of where the problem comes in. Yeah? Uh, I'm not sure anybody has seen anything that sort of does parameterized queries for like Mongo or Elasticsearch. Just for the audience in case, because again, listen out for it, ask for it, maybe someone will come up with one. Yeah? Uh, uh, because th that's, that's really what we need. Yeah? We need something like parameterized queries for that. Now, you can still help us a little bit by like, validating your input before you send it to the database, but you know, that's hard. Yeah? Um, let's say you, you have complex JSON objects that include JSON objects because you, know, you 
um, want to sort of move those complex objects around, that's, that's when the problems happen. Yeah. 